Hello to all the rugby league diehards and welcome to another episode of Six to Go. My name is Tom Canfell and it's great to have your company. As we head into today's episode, you know how it works. We will cover six topics related to the game or even their own career. My guest this week is Josh Hannay. Fresh off Queensland's Game 1 win, Josh will take us behind the scenes from the perspective of his role as assistant coach as we break down how Queensland were able to get the job done in Sydney on Wednesday night. Hope you enjoy our chat. Here's Josh Hannay. I'm joined by Queensland and Cronulla assistant coach Josh Hannay as the next guest of the 60 Go podcast. Josh, congrats on Game 1. How are you doing? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, first uh, first of all. Um, obviously still on a high from um, Wednesday night. It was um, it was just a really wonderful experience to, to be a part of. I, um, you know, proud Queenslander, and um, I couldn't, you just could not be proud of the effort. Obviously, it was great to win the game, but I think um, whether you're involved in the game or whether you're just a supporter, uh, Queenslander, proud Queenslander watching at home, I just thought to see um, 17 young men, you know, out there going about the game the way they did, some guys on debut. Some other guys have played, you know, less than five games. It was, a, it was a relatively young side, and I just thought the way they, the character they showed under extremely um, stressful circumstances in front of a hostile New South Wales crowd, I, it was a really proud um, feeling uh, at the, at the um, end of that game. So it was, it was wonderful to be a part of, mate. Well, mate, it's a pleasure to have you on, and I'll get things kick-started with the preparation for the game. Take me behind the scenes, because as far as we could tell, it was a pretty seamless run in for Queensland. Apart from Harry Grant, maybe at the start, how was the lead in from your perspective? Yeah, I think uh, that preparation, I said this a, a couple of times throughout the camp, was was spot on. Like In terms of how you would hope or how you envisage a preparation going leading into camp, it's as good as it could have been. It was, you know, we had, uh, everyone was fit and available. There was no uh, rampant flu, you know, spreading throughout the squad and, you know, there's no bedridden players, and there was no, there's just no doubt over anyone. And you know, you, you mentioned Harry; he was a little bit of doubt because he missed the week prior. But it, but once he got into camp, he was actually flying, and, and, and he didn't miss a, a second of training. So that gave us great confidence as a coaching group that every day we were able to train the way we wanted to train, we were able to play people where we wanted to play them, and we were able to build the connections and the combinations we wanted to build. And um, over the years, that's easier said than done. Um, Origin has a way of, you know, players limping into um, camp, carrying niggles and not able to train early in the week and then guys picking up flus and it can sometimes be a messy uh, preparation, but ours was flawless and, and I've got to say, it needed to be, you know. I thought, you look at the game, you look what it took to win that game, um, we needed to be as good as we were and and it took a really good preparation to prepare our guys to play that way, yeah. Was there a moment in camp you became really confident about our chance of winning? I was really confident. Um, you, you never get ahead of yourself, but I was really confident when the team was named. I looked at the team and I just thought, that is a, a, a team of young men that are high on confidence, high on belief and in really good form. And, um, you know, the bulk of our squad came from three clubs sitting in the top four in the Brisbane Broncos, the Cowboys and um, the Melbourne Storm. So that's a really good position to start you can when you know you're getting guys coming in that you don't have to try and elevate their confidence or elevate their belief. You just have to bring them together. And that was, that was what we're able to do. You know, they came in, they were really, um, they were buzzing based on, you know, what they've been able to do at club level. So the coaching group, you know, that gave us great confidence from, from the, from the get go that we had a, a, a group that we were informed, really confident, and all we had to do was, um, I guess, steer them and guide them through the week to get them ready to, to play the game of their life on Wednesday. How was it working with Billy Cam and JT? And what did you make of Billy's efforts as a head coach? Yeah, I thought, um, as, a, as, a, as a coaching collective, I, I thought we complemented each other really well. I thought, um, obviously, Bill had a really clear picture in his own mind and has had for some time about how he wanted the coaching set up to look and, and in terms of roles and responsibilities. And and I thought um, we all had great clarity on, on what our roles were and, and how to de- deliver on those roles. So from from, from the get-go, um, we, were, we were really, um, you know, well-connected as a coaching group. And I think, again, that rubs off on the players. I think players, are, players have a real good sense for when coaches are, are well-organised, well-planned and well-prepared. And, and, and they also... Um, realise when it, the shoe's on the other foot and there's a bit of 
um, uncertainty around things and coaches aren't quite sure and there's a bit of mixed messaging and all that stuff. So I thought we did a really good job from the get-go of, of really um, being on, being connected and, 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 and complementing each other. And, and, and the guy who obviously drove all that was Billy. And um, he, um, the way he coached and the way he went about the week and the, and the coach that he is um, didn't surprise me at all. I've, over the years, I've had little... Um, interactions with Bill and um, through media and, and through through football and and I think yeah, anyone who talks about Bill talks about his meticulous approach to the his game when he played the game and you hear him talk about the game now in commentary and you, you can hear the you can hear the um, you know there's a high football intellect there right so I think no one was surprised that he was so meticulous in camp um, really well organised. Um, which ensured that everything from from the top down was just you know on point with our preparation. So, uh, very good young coach. You know where he wants to take it. That's completely up to him, and he could take it wherever he wants to. I think to be really honest, but certainly he's got the capabilities of being a very good coach, and I think already he's a really good coach. Yeah. Okay, Josh. Let's get into the game. First of all, something that went wrong for Queensland was Xavier Coates, unfortunately getting injured. Obviously it's pretty rare to be carrying a winger on the bench. So some shuffling had to be done with Kate Wilder center and Holmes to the wing. At that moment, was there any other combo you thought of going with, or was that really the plan if a winger went down? And also, can you tell me how you thought those guys went after being shuffled around? Jerome, uh, Jeremiah and I would have been bought on a lot earlier than he would have expected. Yeah, I think um, there's, there's basically when you go into a game, there's, you've got two plans. There's, uh, rotation plans. There's plan A, which is everything goes to plan, and you, it, there's no injuries, and you, you you have a really clear plan on how that looks. And plan B is, um, you know, planning for catastrophe, basically, and you're losing people to injury, and uh, particularly outside backs because you generally don't carry outside backs on the bench. So we had a, we did have a plan around if an OB went down, and, and certainly Kirk Capel was always plan A for us if one of our backs. Did get hurt. Um, he was he was always first choice to move there. We felt comfortable with Dal Holmes moving to the wing, although it's not Cape's best position. We know he can play centre. He's, he's, he's a smart footballer, so we felt comfortable with that. And we really, you know, there are other people like you, you know, you could push Cameron Munster to to centre, or if if, if you know Caelan Ponga went to got injured, you could push you know Cameron to to full back and Ben Hunt into the halves. So we we had options. We felt like to cover. Um, just about any um, situation. So I thought we I thought we pulled the right rein. I thought Val Holmes going to the wing probably played his best game in Queensland colours. I thought Capes um, did a phenomenal job in, in just keeping us nice and solid out there on that edge. And and then, yeah, the Jeremiah Nenoy won. Certainly he was a guy we were probably thinking best case scenario, all going to plan, bring him on in the second half and uh, fresh legs because we know he's quite a dynamic sort of game-changing um, threat out there on the field so getting him out there earlier was, was not intended but again just something we had to do and, and again I thought that kid showed great toughness and resilience to, to get hurt come off, uh, come back on the field and, and, and close out the game for us so yeah I thought I thought he, while there was a few things go down that weren't ideal I thought as a group, as a coaching group and then as a playing group reacting to the changes I thought we did a really good job Xavier Coates, uh, unfortunately, is probably going to be out for the rest of the series, or at least game two. Can you shed any light on what happens here? Do you think Val stays at centre and you bring in another winger, or do you think Val would shift to uh, the wing and bring in another centre? Oh, listen, and I say this, um, this is just my opinion. Sure. There's been no discussion at all um, post-game around what we will do there, but you know, we had Murray Tuolangi and, and Hamaso, um, Tabuai Fidel in the in the camp for game one. So those two guys are, have been fantastic at club level. But I'd say particularly Murray, like he's hasn't missed a beat this year. Uh, Hammerstone's had a few injuries and, and, and been out for a little while, but we all know the talent that he is. And so those two guys, we feel um, based on what we've seen from them during camp one um, and certainly the form they've displayed at club level, that I, I can't see there being any hesitancy from the selectors in, in going with either one of those guys and, and, and leaving Val in the centre. Because so, Val's, Val's been doing such a great job at Clubland all year at centre. And um, and, I, and as I say, I think either one of those two guys would, wouldn't let us down if they got the opportunity to play on the wing for Queensland. Pat Carrigan comes on at the 15-minute mark with one of the most impressive origin debuts you'll see. What did you think of his game? 
Yeah, I've got to say, I um, like I, I've had a, I've coached Paddy over the years. I coached him in junior Queensland teams, and um, so he's been on my radar for uh, I'd say four or five years now. And 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 I've always thought Pat was a good player, um, but I thought I thought to be really honest the other night, his game was elite. That was a performance of an elite middle forward. I've it blew me away. Like I. And he came on at a time where I'd say New South Wales were, were slightly on top. They were, I'd say they were probably winning uh, those early exchanges in the opening 20 minutes. And, you know, he, did, and he didn't do it single-handedly, but no coincidence, the moment he came on the field, we just we were, we were playing on the front foot a little bit more on the back of some of his carries. Um, his, his line speed and defence and physicality and defence seemed to lift us a little bit as well, his intensity and... I just thought it was a real coming of age performance, and um, as I say, I, I, I was fully expecting Pat to be up to that level and to play really well. But I, I just thought his performance the other night was was something that um, was just out of this world. To be really frank, I just thought it was an incredible performance, and he took his game to a whole other level. and And it makes you wonder now where he can take his game to long term. Um, he's coming off a, a serious knee injury, uh, missed the bulk of last year. Um, so when you see a guy play, play like that under those circumstances uh, for the first time in that arena, it really excites you to just think about where he could get to with his football um, with so many um, years to come, yeah. Josh, he strikes me as a 25 to 30 game origin player and potentially future captain, and he must be a natural leader because he was made captain of the Broncos after about half a game of NRL. What, what's he like in camp, and do you get the same vibes that he's a natural leader? Yeah, he's definitely a natural leader. Um, as I say, the interactions I had with him when he was just 18, he was a really mature head, um, well-spoken, um, well-educated young guy, very respectful and basically you know, demonstrated all the qualities uh, you look for in, in, in a young person and certainly a young leader. So it doesn't surprise me that he's had some um, leadership bestowed upon him there at the Broncos. Um, and I, I just think... Um, you know, you think about what Brisbane have been through the last couple of years and the turmoil and wooden spoons and, and all that, and he's basically been seen as a young leader there amongst a lot of other young players. And I I think that period of time has potentially steeled him for the rest of his career. And, and I've got no doubt um, some of the lessons he's probably learned over the last two years, some players and some leaders don't learn over their entire career, you know what I mean? He's learning those at a young age and I think that's only going to steal him as a player and as a leader for, for, for years to come and I think, can he stay on the park? You know, I think um, he's really primed uh, to have a wonderful career moving forward, both as a middle forward and as a leader for sure. I can't imagine the plan was for him to play 65 minutes nor Ruben Cotter 80, um, but do you think that this experience for them and uh, not only the fact that they had to go through that, but to come out with a win will do them wonders going forward. The fact that both of them probably were expecting to play maybe half the time and yet that they had to go the rest of the game. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for, for, for Pat and Ruben, like we we knew they had big minutes in them. That's what they do at club level. But as you say, it certainly wasn't plan A for, for Ruben to play 80 minutes or for Pat to play 65. And as things um, played out, it, it, that's just how what we needed them to, and we were really fortunate that when called upon, we had guys capable of doing what they did. Um, big minute players at club level, and it's but again, it's another level of footy, right? So even though we we asked that of them, it, you don't know that they're capable of it until they do it, and they just came through with such flying colours. And you know, both young guys have had injury concerns. I had a fair bit to do with Ruben through my association with the Cowboys. Um, you know, he missed two and a half years of football through back-to-back knee reconstructions. And that that perseverance and resilience, I've got no doubt, has helped shape and form that young guy now for, for who he is today and the way he plays today. And and Pat's not dissimilar. You know, he's coming off a serious knee injury and um, clearly, as I say, a, a wonderful young man made of the right stuff. So for those two young guys to demonstrate what they did the other night and knowing the young men that they are, um, certainly, you know, the world's at their feet and, and um, you know, all going well. They can stay in the park and um, they can be leaders of their respective clubs and, and, and um, you know, some of the best young forwards in our game for years to come, for sure.
Josh, can you talk to me about what happened at half time? Queensland up six four. What was the mood of the in the coach's box, and what was said at half time? Yeah, I think we were really calm. I think um, the try before half time absolutely was important. I thought, um, I, I probably, if I'm to be honest, I thought New South Wales just had the better of the opening twenty, and I thought little by little we, you know, um, built our way back into that first half, and probably just for getting on top before half time and a, and a try was always going to give us as a young group, give us, you know, a really good lift. And so it was really important coming into the sheds that, you know, to be leading on the scoreboard, uh, considering we didn't dominate the first half, we weren't perfect, you know, not everything went our way to be sitting in the sheds uh, up um, new coaching group, new, new, new team. It was a really uh, calm, but really positive uh, vibe in the sheds. And there wasn't a lot said, I think, we're really clear going into the game on what we needed to do, and it was just reinforcement of those messages at half time about here we are, you know, we're, we're where we wanted to be. It's a tight game. This is what we expected. Um, nothing changes for us. We need to go out there in the second half and 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 really um, execute the plan we came here to execute, and and that's on both sides of the ball, defensively and, and offensively. And so it was really clear. I thought our leaders were really. Um, really wonderful, like Daly and Cameron Munster and, and Josh Papali. Even though Josh didn't get a lot of minutes, he's you know, a hugely respected figure amongst the, the group. So those three guys um, spoke really well and, and were really sure as well about what was needed. So there's certainly a real positivity and a real um, certainty about us at half time about you know, what we needed to do for the second 40 minutes to really go on with the job, yeah. Was there a sense that Queensland had the momentum at that stage, and particularly when the bench injected itself like it did, and they were starting to really dominate the ruck, like Carrigan, Collins, and Grant in particular? Yeah, there's no doubt. As I said, I think the second 20 minutes of that first half, we we felt like we were starting to to gain the ascendancy, and, and there's no doubt we came. And then with that try, we came into half time with a, with a real spring in our step and a lot of energy. And um, I've been in plenty of dressing sheds uh, over the years though at half time where um, you go out for the second half and if you miss your start, you miss the start of that second half, you, things can quickly go the other way and, and, and you can be on the back foot from the from the get-go. So it was really important that those guys went out and, and, and continued to, to build on that ascendancy we gained in the first half. And I thought that opening 20 minutes to the second half was just unbelievable. The, the pressure, the, the effort, the energy, the execution, uh, we, we were the one making play in that those opening exchanges of the second half. And then, you know, just some class touches from our key players um, to sort of capitalise on that that high-pressure game we were playing. It was it was a really impressive opening to that second half, which we needed. The effort to nullify Nathan Cleary as much as possible, the one aspect of this series I was really concerned about as a Queenslander was the lack of Christian Welch. And, you know, you see when Melbourne are able to beat Penrith, Christian Welch is constantly putting pressure on the kicker. How much was that uh, re-emphasised at halftime? Because at the start of the game, Nathan uh, kicked one um, in goal on the full. And uh, I know it's not in general play kicking, but he also missed a conversion as well. And for someone as good as Nathan, though, those mistakes are rare. Yeah, I think, you know, going into the game, there was a real clarity of um, what we needed to do um, in terms of nullifying their strengths. And they, they, they've got many strengths across the field, you know, from Tedesco to Yo to Cleary, um, their middle forwards, Cook out of nine. There's a lot of a lot of really key parts to their game and, and guys you have to negate. But certainly Nathan Cleary's kicking game is, it's it's you don't have to be a rock and scientist to, to, to know that that's one of the, one of the really um, great parts of his game and and, and a real um, key to their to them as a team the way he he ends their sets for them. So, you know, we we spoke a lot about it, but I I thought our effort on Nathan was really good. I, but I thought it was also really smart. We weren't overcooking it. We weren't overdoing it with our kick pressure. We were just uh, making sure that there was always someone though uh, in his presence, whether whether he's kicking the ball, passing the ball. Um, we just did a really good job, I think, on the night of, of putting, as I say, enough pressure on him. But it wasn't stupid pressure. It wasn't guys coming out of the line, creating you know space and gaps for him to to sort of play ad lib footy off and expose us. It was really smart pressure and really um, really measured. And and I think that was really important for us. And it's going to be important for us all series. At half time, what were you most concerned about? 
Um, that's a good question. I was probably just continue, you know, continue to be most concerned about um, the opposition. You know, I know, I just know how hard it is to to nullify players like James Tedesco, uh, Nathan Cleary, Damien Cook. Um, you know, Isaiah, you know, these types of players, I just know how hard it is to to nullify that, their influence over a game for 80 minutes. And so my concerns remain were the same at halftime as they were at uh, the beginning of the game as of what they were all week is, you know, our ability as a group to, to um, yeah, to nullify their influence over the game. And so going into the second half, as I said, I just thought the opening 20 minutes was critical for us. And, and I thought we obviously won the game in that period. We, we we came out, we dominated those exchanges. And then, you know, those guys, they never stopped playing, right? In the last 10 minutes, you know, they got a little sniff um, and they just kept playing, they kept playing, they kept coming, they kept coming. And and that's that's why they're great. They don't stop playing. They don't stop asking questions. They don't stop trying to win games of footy. So I was never, I was never satisfied until the final whistle went. Um... You know, just about the threats that those those guys pose, yeah. The outside backs for New South Wales gained the most metres in the game. Tedesco, Tyro and Tupo all over 200 metres. Uh, do you just put that down to the fact of how quick the game was? Because it seemed like it was a tactic even from their first set. Yeah, I think, you know, every even at club level as, as a team, um, we, all, we all have our own ways of getting downfield, if that makes sense. For some teams, it's 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 a real reliance on, you know, back five out of the backfield and, 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 and getting their set started. For other teams, it's power game through the middle with their big men. For other teams, it's shifting the ball to make metres. And, you know, so we always knew with New South Wales and Toto and Tedesco, they're, they're big metre eaters um, at club level. And even um, Tupo, um, you know, makes plenty of metres. So... You know, those guys are going to do what they do. They're going to make their metres. And um, what we had to be good at was making sure they didn't make big plays. Um, so when they made their metres, you know, at the end of that carry, it wasn't a really lightning fast play the ball that led to a big play. Like we, I thought we did a pretty good job, even though they made their metres. Um, and Tedesco certainly had his moments. I thought we um, negated their big play or their impact plays on the night. And, and that's really important because, as I say, those guys, that's thats how they play. They're going to make their metres. Um, you know, so we need to limit their ability, though, to have those big plays, those big impact plays and, and those quick play the balls that create, generate frequency and generate ruck speed for guys like Nathan and Yo to then play off. How do you decide who to plan to target with kicking? Because even though Toto is the shortest of their back three, I'd imagine a big part of targeting him is the fact that he gains so many metres and he's probably their best carry on first and second tackle. So by kicking to him, it's not so much the, the aerial battle, although that is a the factor, but you're just trying to limit those run metres because he's so good. Yeah, my mantra always with kickers, and this is at club level and it was the same on Wednesday night, is I just have a best kick mantra. So I don't like kickers to turn themselves inside out trying to get to a point to kick to a certain spot on the field. I think... Sometimes that can be counterproductive and it can actually confuse a kicker and you can end up with a with a low percentage last play because you're just in your head, you're in your mind, you've got this idea of you've got to get to this point to get this kick on. And it, the game's just too unpredictable for that eventuation to always happen. So my message to our to kickers, um, as I say, at club level at Cronulla and, 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 and to our guys on Wednesday night was just the best kick mantra. So wherever you think is the best put position as our set is unfolding um, to get to, to get away your best kick, whether that's to Tupo, whether it's to Tedesco, whether it's to Toto, whatever our best kick is, that's going to be our best kick every time. So while I might have seen the other night we were kicking to Toto more than Tupo, it certainly wasn't a plan. It's probably just how our set's unfolded. And um, But, yeah, I'm, always a, I'm a big believer of our guys just always getting their best possible kick away. Just just talking about a general principle in rugby league at the moment, not so much state of origin. It, it's more so to do with club, actually. Um, the back three, it, I've noticed this year in particular, th- there's a real, um, and I don't know if that's just me being slow onto it, but there's a real difference between the top teams and the bottom teams as far as their back three goes. You, to me, you need to have two out of the three 
that are natural meter eaters. And I'll, and I'll bring up an example of that. So at the start of the year, the Dragons started off with Sloan at the back and uh, Ravalawa on one side and Ramsey on the other. Now, Ra now Ravalawa is a meter eater, but Sloan and Ramsey aren't really known for that. And they really struggled. And as soon as they, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to say that they're bad players. It, it just wasn't a fit. As soon as they brought in Fenai and then they had Ravalawa there, the two meter eaters out of the backfield, they really improved from there. Is that, is that a general principle you see as well? Um, yeah, I think, you know, without going into too much detail around, you know, technicalities and um, the sort of tactical side of the game, trans, the transition part of rugby league is, is, a, is a part of the game that's crucial. So whether you're transitioning from attack to defence or defence to attack, your ability to, to win that, that transition is, is a really important part of our game. Our game is a transition game. So, it, you know, and, and, and I guess um, clubs, it does help, I guess what I'm trying to say, is to have a back three, certainly a back five, um, we refer to, that has the ability to get you on the front foot when you're transitioning from defence to attack, um, to get downfield as far as we can on those early plays, one, two, three, to then allow our middles to sort of integrate into the set at the back end and their halves to... To, to, to basically put their fingerprints on the back end of the set as well. It's if you've got a back five that can get you forward out of your end on those early plays, um, better than the opposition. It's certainly it's certainly beneficial. Um, and whether clubs at the moment are building their roster to to play that way and and, and are putting huge emphasis on bringing in wingers and centres that are particularly good out of the backfield, I'm not sure. I know at Cronulla we. We feel like we've got a really effective back five. Will Kennedy is more a, a threat on shape, but certainly Ronnie Mulatalo, Sione Katoa, uh, Jesse Ramey and Sifa Talakai, those four guys pride themselves on their ability to get our set started out of the backfield. And, and we certainly are a team that benefit from their ability to do that really well. Just talking about outside backs and wrapping up this um, conversation, I know you won't probably won't want to say much, but um, how surprised were you that Josh Adokar didn't get a run for New South Wales, and as a as a bigger principle, a lot of a lot's been talked about that he hasn't been in good form. Well, I would argue that the Bulldogs haven't been in good form, but he's actually been uh, uh, fine, uh, or even a better player, just in a bad system. Can you talk about um, how this might affect players going forward, uh, going to different teams? Because Josh, if he was still in Melbourne, I've got no doubt would have been picked. Yeah, it's a good question, and it's a it's a decision that. Um, certain players have to make throughout their career. Um, sometimes you can you can make your money and 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 win, and that's great. That's the ideal situation for any player is to win comps and make good money doing that. For others, um, there, there comes a time in their career where an offer comes along, and it's as, as Josh had to to make this choice. It's you know. I know I can win lots of football games here, potentially premierships at, at Melbourne, but this financial offer that I'm getting from another club um, is just too good to refuse. So that, those decisions uh, are often difficult ones for players in, in Josh's position, and and it's really hard. The fact that he's won premierships, I think, probably made it easier for him to make the decision. He, he's been to the top of the mountain, played for New South Wales, his country, he's won premierships, so... He probably felt like um, for his financial future, you know, making the financial decision at this point was the right one. Um, but again, one of the other side things to that is you, you do potentially risk losing um, your representative jersey. So it's, again, it's another um, another um, eventuation you've got a um, eventuality you've got to weigh up. Is what do my rep jerseys mean to me? Am I prepared to lose these? Am I prepared to risk losing these? I don't think Josh has been particularly bad at, at the Bulldogs this year. Um, I, you know, again, it's not in my business really, but I felt like he's probably hard done by. I don't think he's been terrible, and I think one thing that Josh poses to any opposition is his speed always poses a threat. So whether it's an early kick, whether it's a loose ball, um, his ability to turn a half chance into a six points purely because of his speed. It's a scary proposition for any team and it's something you have to sort of game plan and you have to defend. So not having that out there the other night, it, it meant we didn't have to worry about that that situation arising, about Josh getting into the backfield and 
Josh picking up a loose ball or Nathan putting in an early kick for Josh. Um, that was a, that was one less sort of worry and concern we, we, we had to worry about. So, yeah, I think he's a little hard done by. Um, I don't think he would regret his decision leaving Melbourne to go to Canterbury. I think you know it's clear why he made the decision and, and can understand why he made it. And I, But I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he um, makes his way back into that side, yeah. When the New South Wales team was first picked, with Whiten in the centres and Crichton on the bench, did you initially think that there would be a swap coming that Whiten would start from the bench? Yeah, uh, yeah. To be honest, we 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 thought you know they'd go with Crichton to start the game. Um, we didn't put it at any point a lot of uh, energy into it. You know, we our focus and it's just cliched and and but it's true. Our focus all week really was us. Um, but you know, we thought that it just probably made more sense and 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 was. That that Steve, that um, Crichton would start there um, with his Penrith combination. Yeah. Is there something I haven't mentioned that really stood out to you about the game, and what were you happiest most from a coaching standpoint? Um, yeah, I think it was funny uh, in the sheds after the game um, as a coaching group. It's it's finally the the moment. You know, when you win, it's finally the moment where you get to exhale and kind of, you know, like feel good about yourself and feel like, yeah, we, we did prepare these guys really well and you can reflect on the pre- re- preparation and, and all those things. And I think, you know, for us, you know, no one wanted to sort of say it because, again, in preparation doesn't gar- guarantee anything. But we were, we were really, really confident in the fact that we felt like there was nothing more we could do from a preparation point of view, to have those guys any better prepared to play that game on Wednesday night, and as I say, we didn't. That didn't make us sit back and go, "Oh, beauty, we're just going to get out of here and win it," because that's not how it works. But I just thought um, it was a real credit to, to everyone involved with the setup and all the preparation that went in leading into game one. Like I, when you talk about a six-point margin, and it was like on the edge of your seat that last ten minutes, the margins are so fine. Um, you look back to your preparation and you go, like, we, you know, that's what we were able to play the way we played because we got so many things right in the lead up and including the team selection, you know. I just thought the team was the perfect team and I thought, you know, the preparation was the perfect preparation and, and all that perfection and still only led to a six point victory and, you know, by the skin of our teeth. So it just goes to show you how hard State of Origins are to win, particularly against the top opposition. So, you know, it's we're able to enjoy it for that moment, but like already, I'm here today, starting to not stress, but starting to get anxious about game two and making sure I, you know, I do my job and I play my part in ensuring our preparation for game two, and then game three is is just as good as it was in game one. Yeah, we'll wrap it up with chatting about Cameron Munster. Um, he was phenomenal. There's no doubt. Uh, how how do you plan against him, uh, particularly at Clubland, obviously. How, how do you, because there's no, like, there's no set play he does that's, like, that's crazy. Like, how do you plan against him? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I, I, um, you know, I feel really fortunate. It's one of the, 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 the great things for me about being involved in the Origin setup is, you know, you get to coach alongside legends like Billy and, and um, Cam and JT, but... Uh, for mine, Cameron's a, a modern day legend. Like he, he's going to go down when it's all said and done as one of the greats to play our game. And to to kind of witness the the wizardry and the mastery and the um, the mad scientist that he is, all in one. He's all these things in one, right? Like is, and he says himself, he doesn't know what he's going to do. I just think he, he's he's a wonderful, wonderfully gifted, instinctive player, and he plays with such an air of confidence and freedom that. I think you get all players that look to him with jealousy because we all we all kind of feel like we need structure in our lives to to, to be our best and, and and certainly there is a place in, in in what we do for structure but we all kind of feel like we need to know what's happening next or how I can make this happen and he's a guy that I've got no I've got no doubt he he has a plan in his head about how he wants to play and and, and what he thinks will work but once he gets out there and things start to become unpredictable and, you know, there's a loose ball or there's a, you know, an offload or he starts beating defenders, that's actually the moment 
where he's at his greatest and, 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 and where the defence is at its uh, most vulnerable because he doesn't know what he's going to do. The defence sure as hell doesn't know what he's going to do. And he's just, he's, he's in that moment, he's on autopilot and it's one of the, the best things to see in football. And it's his gift, right? It's his gift. That's what he does better than anyone. And um, those, the other night when he started in that second half to bounce across their line and it started to get a bit ad lib, that's when we're in the box getting excited because we're going, this is him in his domain. This is where he's at his most dangerous. And, and sure enough, he, he broke the game open with moments like that, yeah. I um I know New South Wales had their chances. The the Tupo forward pass to Tedesco, um, that was called back. But I, you'd have to take some confidence being a Queenslander out of that game, wouldn't you? Because Munster, I think he made three line breaks and Queensland scored off none of them. Yeah, and, you know, Ben Hunt at the end there, another... Another um, Rockhampton boy um, making the line break down the left-hand side there at the death. If he plays back to the inside to Daly Cherry Evans, we score under the post and it's a 24, uh, sorry, it'd be a 22-10 final score. And I reckon, to be honest, um, I reckon that probably would have been a fair score line. I think, as you say, the Blues created their chances. Um, I think we created at least as many. And and I, I thought we were probably a, a, a 10 or 12-point better team on the night. So... Um, yeah, I think the fact that we feel like we left some points out there as well, um, we certainly, I think, I don't think we can play with better effort. I certainly think we can play with better execution. And if we can add better execution and maintain that effort for game two and three, I think, um, you know, I think we're going to be in good stead. It wasn't even Cameron Munster's offense that was most impressive to me throughout the night. He had like three or four steals of the football and Joey had a really great line in commentary, it was when it was when Crichton was attacking the Queensland line and Cameron Munster stripped the ball out. He, he said that there was ninety thousand people in the stadium. Yeah, there was only one person thinking of a strip. How 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 important is that ability of Cam's to, for his whole game to be able to and and not only for him personally but for the team to turn the ball over at moments like that? Oh, the huge moments like um, you know pe- people talk about state of origin and, and guys like. You know, I don't pretend for one moment to to understand the state of origin arena. Like I played a couple of games, but it certainly wasn't my uh, domain. But, you know, you hear guys like JT and Cameron and Billy talk about state of origin and they talk about moments. And, and um, there's always these moments in state of origin where it's, if you can win those moments, you invariably come out on top. Um, in and around that, the game's going on, and there's back and forth, and game. It's you know, it's physical, and it's a game of chess. But in and around, there's always these really big moments, and and I just thought, um, I think Cameron's just one of those guys who he more often than not, if he's involved in a big moment, he's going to win the big moment, and it's just how he is. He just he backs himself, he he makes the play, um, and he trusts himself to make the play. And it was a, it was a huge play, like it was. That point in the game, it was yeah, it was a real, you know, it was on a nice edge, and then and it was just a, it was a miraculous play, and and again, like Joey said, just the balls to think, <laughs> think of that in front of ninety thousand people on the biggest stage, like in the heat of that battle, to go, yep, I'm going to pick this guy's pocket, and like, <laughs> it was just, it was just crazy, yeah, crazy, and probably a play only he's going to make. Well, Josh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the 60O podcast today. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Good luck in game two and for Cronulla over the next week. Hopefully we can get, we can get you on maybe after the series. No, always a pleasure, mate. Um, enjoy what you do. And, yeah, hopefully um, after game three we're celebrating a series victory, yeah. Sounds good to me. Thanks, mate. No worries. Big thanks to Josh for coming on the show today. He's gone straight back into an away camp for Cronulla, so for him to spare some time to come on was great and hopefully we can chat to him after the series. By the way, if you want to get in contact with me, you can on Twitter at TCanfell, and don't forget to give the 6 to Go Facebook page a like as well. My name is Tom Canfell. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe, and until next time, this has been the 6 to Go podcast, and that is full time.